we do projects with the little kids, like eighth graders will go along with the first graders and kindergartners. And it just goes like there's one from kind of each grade and we do projects together. It's very interesting to me that you're not hearing anyone talking about this, like the national leaders, the governors, whoever, you, you're just not hearing these conversations. The pods movement was, was not designed to address all of the systemic problems. It was a response to a lack of childcare and schools. You know, yeah, no pods are literally down. just like a little lifeboat. Like if your if your ship is sinking, you know, yeah. then you have a lifeboat. That's all. And and so and so to ask, yeah, no, there's, there's no there's nothing else other than that. And and that lifeboat is not licensed, you know. Like I guarantee you, you know. So um, you know, but there's ways there's ways to do it. I think that are still within most most laws and most jurisdictions. I mean, if you're getting together with one other family you know, you're still logging into your pre-pandemic school's remote learning offerings and the parents are just taking turns. Hello and welcome to Reinventing School. This is our 14th episode as we're trying to figure out the impact of the coronavirus and the economic impact and all of those different pieces on a much chained environment for school. Every day we're finding out that more and more teachers, more and more students, more and more parents are nervous about having school open at all or attending a school building where it might be dangerous. Um, so what we've done is sort of followed on the good work of, it turns out to be quite a few people um, who are investigating and pursuing an alternative. Um, now you may have heard the terms pod schools, particularly within the last month or so, micro schools, and a few other ideas. Uh, it's not as if it's a very new idea to have adults teaching children in small groups, but that's just the beginning of a conversation. So, uh, Leanne, let me, let me just ask you simply, what has happened to your life in the last month? I started a Facebook group with a friend in order to help people in my local area connect and talk about childcare and schooling options during this time when school districts are not, you know, in, in our area, we're not going to be able to open physically. Um, and more people joined the Facebook group than we could possibly ever have imagined. We have almost 40,000 people now um, and, and all these local chapters. And yeah, I don't know. We still don't have answers, um, but we have a lot of people who are getting together, trying to talk about you know, what, what the options are and trying to figure things out. This is an enormous undertaking in a very short time with a deadline because school has to, or we have to begin the school year, let's say it that way. Mara, this is not a new concept, although it feels like a very new concept. Can you explain a bit about micro schools and, and sort of give us the overview? Sure. Um, so micro schools is a newer term for something that's been going on for probably about 100 years. We've had um, really since the advent of formal, really formal compulsory education, we've had people who um, thought that maybe more locally controlled or or personally controlled small schools that were tailored to the specific needs of kids was a good idea. So um, if people want some ideas of where that comes from, it's people like um, Neil and the Summerhill or the, the um, uh, Sudbury schools, the open free democratic schools, the Waldorf schools, the Montessori schools, those would be the ones that people know about. Um, the idea of doing something different than big public compulsory education has been around. Micro schools is the newest term. It kind of describes a resurgence of the one room schoolhouse with lots of the best technologies, the best practices, multi aged, uh, multidisciplinary kinds of education. Um, a little bit more long lasting as far as our, our desires for micro schools to be a thing. Um, 
have, we've been working on this stuff for a while and uh, our hope is that you know this sort of need for different kinds of education like pods like pod learning will help to create um, new interest in and new anchoring into what has been called the alternative education movement for a long time so yeah well, the time might be right for an alternative. Tasha, you've been at this for a bit, and you not only, you're part of an organization, right? And you also, I believe, are a teacher. So can you kind of give us a sense of what your life has looked like? And along the way, if you could hit the terms pod, micro school, and a few others and define them for us, that would be helpful. So my journey micro schooling started about 14 years ago. Um, I'm a licensed teacher in two states, Ohio and Indiana. I'm the daughter of two teachers who spent most of their careers in public schools. Um, my intention was not to become a teacher, but we see how that worked out. <laughs> I ended up working with a small group of children with special needs. And then I ended up working as a traveling tutor for families who were homeschooling. This was about uh, 13, 14 years ago. And I've been microschooling ever since. They've always been small groups. We didn't call them pods, but that's what they were. And, um, and they've been called different names, just as Mara mentioned. Um, but we've been microschooling all of this time. It's looked different. We've microschooled in a lot of different places, in coffee shops, in libraries, in other schools, um, in art studios, um, in garages. Uh, we've we've microschooled practically everywhere. So micro-schooling can happen um, anywhere, anytime. It's really all about your intention and your desire to facilitate meaningful learning. Uh, I'm going to jump over to one of the kids. We have several, uh, one of the students. Emily, um, uh, unmute please. And it, tell me, do you go to school in like a tiny house or in a one-room schoolhouse? Tell me about your life at school. So we the school I go to, it's called Bin Prairie, and basically we have this sort of farmhouse thing. It's basically built like a miniature barn, and we have a top level, a main level, and a basement, and the different grade levels, kindergarten through eighth grade, are split up in that building. And what grade are you in? I'm in eighth grade. Okay. And Amy, you are actually in a micro school right now. Do I have that sort of right? I, I am. My micro school is in the lower level of my house currently. So this is this is my family basement that I transformed into a school three years ago. Um, and it just kind of happened very organically. I was homeschooling my own kids and had interest from friends who wanted to know if I would possibly you know, homeschool their kids. Looking into it, I decided that I wanted to form a non-public school with the state of Minnesota, which is where I am. And so it's a, it's a private school, a non-public school. And I grew from three to five to seven. And now we're maxed out at 15 and moving to a standalone farm property. That sounds a lot like Emily's situation. I keep thinking about tiny houses, you know, the cable series, right? I'm thinking, well, maybe that's the whole movement here. Um, maybe everything is getting smaller and we're moving away from large buildings. Leanne, what's going on here? Um, with the tiny houses? Well, or with the tiny schools. That's probably the wrong track. But <laughs> like, is there a phenomenon that's happening here? Because you certainly found a lot of interest from yeah. a lot of people. So what are they interested in? And well, I have to say, I, I'm sorry? What are the structures that people are playing with? Because you have a nice overview. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have to say, coming from San Francisco, um, I'm not, I don't know very many people who have a little barn that they're able to host um, their, their children out of. So the, the physical, the physical form can take many shapes. Um, but what we're seeing in, in terms of potting discussions that people are having in our Facebook group, they typically are around, um, Three, three primary different kind of, of types. One is a remote learning pod where the children are still plugged into their pre-pandemic school. They're, they're doing remote learning there and they just need, they need a physical place to be that's safe and supervised and, and maybe has some, some more support. Um, and, um, and, and that's what the children are doing there. Um, the, the second is, is more like a nanny share, that's a little bit maybe less relevant for this conversation because that's more typically for younger children who are not yet in grade school. Um, and the third being um, 
a, a micro school where you hire where where someone is actually delivering instruction that's not um, that's that's not coming online, but it's coming from an instru in, in person instructor. And of course, there can be all kinds of hybrids and combinations of those. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, um, as you mentioned, that some people are are potting together just for playdate, and if their children can actually sit and do Zoom and online learning on their own, um, some families are also potting up um, just so the children can sort of socialize after they get their work done, um, but do so in a way that still limits COVID risks. Um, well, I should say that all of those options could involve a, a, a caregiver or a teacher that's paid, or it could involve, you know, parents or other available adults just swapping out and taking turns. Sorry, Howard? The obvious question, and, and Emily asked it in our chat, is can anybody do it? it? There has to be a licensing component here, unless anybody can be a teacher, which would worry me a bit, probably would worry the students and the rest of you as well. Um, does it have to be in a specific place? I know people who have opened daycare centers, for example, um, in their homes, but that has to be done with strict guidelines that seem to be determined by county or state. So let's start there. Um, before we're building a school building that's purpose built, um, can anybody do this? And is this being regulated in any way? Or is it so new that that just isn't part of the formula? Um, and anybody jump in because I, I don't certainly don't know the answer to myself. You know, I can tell you, Howard, the work that we do, um, I think, can inform this. So one of the pieces that's in our, our business model is to help people to figure out where to go to figure out the legalities of opening a micro school and I don't think it's that different from potting so um, you know somebody who wants to uh, have care of children needs to consult the child care regulations for their particular state be that home uh, homeschooling regulations the actual private school licensure processes for their state um, or uh, you know the child care I think I said that already, but there, you know, if you go to your State Department of Education, you can generally find out um, what the regulations are regarding homeschooling, tutoring services, um, private school licensure, and then you also have child care legislation. But people do need to actually be aware of what they can legally do, what their legal responsibilities are, and most importantly, there needs to be almost always, especially if you're doing this at home, you need to take a look at your homeowner's insurance because you're actually potentially putting yourself in violation of um, your homeowner's policy by bringing extra children into your house for extended periods of time. So those are things people should look for. And I'm, I'm sure Leanne has looked into this as well. And I know that in Pennsylvania, if you have more than a certain number of females in a house, you fall under the brothel rules. So there's a lot of different, right? I mean, it's just sort of a very, because we were operating a startup company in a home and we turned out we weren't able to do that. So there's a lot of surprises because law has been around in the United States for some time. So it seems to me to organize this a bit that part of the question is the physical facility. And for that, we go back to daycare. You need to make sure that entry and egress, you need to make sure that there are two ways of getting, two entrances, right? Uh, two ways to get in and out. You have to make sure that fire code is obeyed. Um, I would think that you have to have appropriate bathroom facilities, that you have to have certain rules related to food. Uh, and we can get into that in more detail. But the other piece is the person who is rendering the services certainly should go through background check. And then we go all the way from, okay, you're safe to be around children to are you qualified to be de delivering instruction? And if so, how is that monitored? So it seems to me those are the big components, but there also would be some sort of a contractual relationship between the school slash teacher pod and the individual parent because of liability, um, and a, a sort of a promise that you're actually going to get educated and not just play Monopoly all day. Carson, do you play Monopoly all day? No, I know there was one recess where we played, but we didn't get the game done. Too bad. <laughs> so tell me what you do all day in a, do you go to school all day or how is it put together for you? And I'm going to throw that over to Brianne because I think Carson is on sell. So our day is usually 
we have seven subjects and what we do is we <laughs> uh, we start usually with math or writing and rhetoric and then we have it doesn't matter what grade you're in um, we have either two recesses or a recess and a PE that goes all the way up through high school as well which high school is not in the same building as K through eight but uh, also we it doesn't matter your age is as well we still have snack as well as the little kids and we do recess since it's a, such a small school we do it all together when you say such a small school how many people are in the school with you and how many are your age how many are older younger in the entire school there are going to be 44 and the past years there's been less but we've added now and they, uh, there's the first two years, it was the older kids had more. The second year there were 16 or 17 of the older kids. And then younger kids, there were about 10. This year, it is about equal. Now, thank you. Mandy, you're, you've been doing this, and hello, I'm sorry, you've been sitting and waiting. Um, you've been doing this for a while your so explain how teaching and instruction and the organization of this uh it takes place and takes shape in your world um yeah well i came to this through a teaching background i i taught in middle schools and junior highs for about a decade and then when i had my own child i decided to homeschool her knowing some of the issues that i didn't particularly like that were happening in the public schools at the time and I formed actually a large group of homeschooling families. And as time went on, more I had more and more people asking me, I really like what you're doing with your daughter. I, I wish I could homeschool my child. It's just not in my wheelhouse. Uh, and so there was interest picking up. And so I, I had been doing some tutoring and some classes here and there all along, but, but I formally formed my company, Shine Together, as a response to the needs of the families in my area people who wanted to homeschool, as well as people who were currently homeschooling, but wanted an opportunity for an, an enrichment experience for their children. Uh, and my school is at my property on 20 acres. So we are outdoors a lot. We are learning hands on, we are planting things in the gardens. We are looking at, you know, rocks and animals and leaves and all the things outdoors. We're doing science very much. Uh, in in the experiential way. So, do you stick with a traditional school curriculum, or do you make up your own? No, no. I actually came to this through the unschooling philosophy of education, which is very much based on what the children are interested in, and taking those interests and then finding shaping the curriculum around what the children already want to do. So seeking out resources and books, websites, experiences where they can learn in depth about something that they're passionate about. Is that legal? Silly question, but you can do that? <laughs> oh, absolutely. You still need to follow all of the homeschooling or, or whatever guidelines, whether you, however you're structured. All of my students are legally homeschoolers in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. And we are required to cover, I, I believe it's like 13 different subject areas. It includes all the, all the things you'd expect, reading, writing, mathematics, science, um, government, economics, history, et cetera. Leanne, is this all, is this typical of, I mean, you're interacting with a lot of different people. Is what you're hearing the shape of pod schooling? Because it seems very confusing to me. There's a lot of pieces and parts. It sounds like homeschooling on steroids in some ways, but there's 44 kids in another school. Help. Yeah, um, I think I think there's a few different things going on. Um, the, the, the folks on this call here are, um, sound more like they've, you know, you've all been part of, you've been doing this for a while, right? You've been doing this for more than a month. Um, and, and, and so you have a structured micro school, right? <laughs> you know, going back to this question about licensure, I, I you know, 
agree with the need to heed laws and, and um, you know, understand licensure requirements and insurance and, and, and figure all of that out. Um, that's important. And of course, we always recommend people follow laws in our Facebook group. Um, however, the, the impossible thing that that families are being faced with right now is that not all families right now have the resources to be able to um, hire a licensed child care provider, hire a certified teacher, get their house checked out and licensed um, as a child care, you know, a, a child care space um, to, to set up, um, you know, to go through all of these formal hoops. Um, and yet, um, all families are going to need a place where their children can be that safe, um, you know, if they cannot be at school. So that is the really impossible thing. And, you know, and, and of course, you know, the ability to, to, to freely pass your kids um, among the families of your community um, and, and take care of the children in, in, a, in a totally traditional sort of village manner is, is also not really available given COVID. Um, so that's the really impossible thing that we're seeing right now. And so we're seeing all of these families, um, not just ones who have been committed to an unschooling or micro-schooling you know, philosophy and process for a period of time, but families who are just hearing now that their school is not going to be open and now they have to figure something out. Um, so what we're seeing in our groups is typically um, a lot less structured um, than, um, than, than, than um, what the folks here sort of are more likely to participate in. Um, a lot of what people are doing, um, you know, especially people who, um, families have fewer resources, you know, less time to kind of put something together. Um, it's often just two or three families getting together, the available adults taking turns, watching the kids and making sure that they have a safe place, helping them to turn off and on Zoom. Um, so and we so are on. now, we're living through, to take it from Hamilton, the unimaginable now. And I want to dig more deeply into that. But first, let's all take a breath. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in less than a minute. The, the most peculiar time, right? Um, because making assumptions is so difficult. I've been attending school board meetings. I've never really done that. And now I'm sitting through hours and hours and hours of them. And they all seem to be based upon the working assumption that school buildings will be viable, that people will want to enter those school buildings and stay there all day, and that there'll be a way of moving people in and out of those buildings through public transportation and school buses. I don't think those assumptions are reasonable. I do think we're in, in a realm of the unimagined consequence now. And I think we're going to be here for a long time. So if, the, if it's dangerous to be in large groups and it's difficult to educate in one-on-one -on -one with parent and, and, and uh, student, having small community groups seems to make an enormous amount of sense. But it has to be qualified and it has to be organized. And of course, some of it's gonna go really well and some of it's gonna go really badly. So can we break this down a bit and talk about this step-by-step? -step? Because I know a lot of people are, are curious, but it's so difficult to kind of get your arms around it. So question number one, I wanna start a small group who I will teach or somebody in my family or a neighbor will teach. So let's not get too, too far into the detail of this, but let's make sure we hit the most important points. My first question for myself would be, are you even remotely capable of doing this? So how do you look at the mirror and say, I can do this? Because we only have so many teachers, many of them are employed, 
um, they're not necessarily going to be able to just go, I'm going to change my life and not make any money at all and just do this. So how do you begin to think about that? And I guess that's a question for Tasha initially. Well, one of the things I do a lot of is mentor new micro school teachers. And I can tell you from doing this for 12 years now that it takes a special kind of person, special kind of teacher to lead a micro school. And even more than that, it takes a special group of families to sustain one. So it's not enough just to build one because a lot of people do start micro schools and they don't last very long. Um, that's one of the reasons our organization created online courses for um, teachers who are interested in doing this. Um, because it, 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 there's a certain skill set that we've sort of identified over the years. Many of the teachers who are used to a traditional classroom do not do well in a micro school setting for obvious reasons. Um, but some Tell of the, me those obvious reasons. Yeah. That the risk that they're <laughs> so not obvious. Is that they're used to being sort of the center. And in a micro school setting, the child is the center. The learning is child driven. Um, so we call ourselves uh, oftentimes guides on the side rather than a stage on the stage. I'm going to stop you for a second. Brianne, do you feel that you're at the center? Unmute, please. The center. Yeah. Have you been to traditional schools? Um, I went to a hybrid school, but it was bigger. So not sure you'd call it con traditional, but it was more traditional than ours. Yes. And tell me what makes your school non-traditional. And do you feel as though it's different, the re relationship between the teacher and the students, or do you feel it's pretty much the same? Yes, it is different. In a bigger school, it is harder to, for the teachers, I feel like, to get to all of the students and understand what they need help with. And in our school, since it's smaller, the teachers have enough time to get to every person. And it is, I feel like they know everybody's strengths and weaknesses, which it's nice for me because if I need help with say Latin or math, they know what I need help with. Mandy, why don't we just do this everywhere? That sounds like a really good idea, what Brianne said. Every child has some degree of in interactive participation with the teacher. Did, isn't that what all schools should be? Or, or am I just speaking to the choir here? No, the choir. I, I think you're absolutely right, Howard. I think that every child could benefit from an education centered on their needs. I think that so many of us who are in the micro school movement came to it because we couldn't give the children what they needed within the public school system. At, at, at a time when I taught seventh graders, I had 33 kids in a classroom, 33. I could not give them each what they needed, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how much, how many extra hours I spent in the building after school and on weekends, I could not attend to all their needs. Now I have nine children at a time. I can attend to their needs, and and then some like we I attend to their academic needs, their social needs, their emotional needs. And it's really, really an amazing experience. I think we're going to see so much more of this. I think there's interest in it because of the specific situation that we're in. But I think it could be a long term solution for for a vast majority of our children. Emily, are you feeling like the life that Mandy is describing is the life you're living at school? Um, yes, very much so. Uh, I actually did go to public school. So uh, in public school, you're very much on a, if you're in first grade, you have to learn this. Well, at our school, if you are not capable of doing seventh grade math or eighth grade math and you're in eighth grade, you can go down and do sixth grade or fifth grade math if that's what you need. And they will help you get to where you need to get to. And, when you're in a public school, it's more like they're telling you, you have to learn this by this age. And if you don't, you are behind and you have to do that grade again. But at the school I am right now, it's so much easier to get help with what you need help with. And if you are already really good at something, you don't necessarily need help in that subject, but they can help you get better. Tasha? I stopped you. You were making a list. So the first item 
was was the item you talked about that we're able to provide a lot of individual attention. What's the second? You have to unlearn everything you learned about being a teacher. Well, and that sounds easy. And learning. What? <laughs> Uh, you know, I had to read all the books that were not required material during my teacher training. Now, my background, um, you know, I did my master's in education. I did a traditional teacher training program, but I also did a Montessori teacher training program, which for me was life changing. A lot of what you see, I think, um, in the micro school community is, is taken from Montessori. It's not always called Montessori, the multi age setting. Um, you know, they sometimes there's a multi sensory aspect. And when I discovered Montessori, it really, it really helped me to understand that there was a different kind of classroom environment, that I could be a different kind of teacher. Um, so let me stop you there for a second. Mara, is, is this something that is a radical departure from traditional school? Forget about whether or not this will become the school reform movement of 2020. But what I'm hearing is essentially sort of a cross between homeschooling and Montessori that just seems like a much more student centered approach. That's great. But is it is it that or is there something larger happening here right now? And I actually think it's a return to our roots in some ways. It's you know, this is a lot of what micro schooling is doing is coming out of uh, the one room schoolhouse of the past, but it has the modern sensibilities, the global sensibilities, um, and the and a level of community involvement that I'm not sure was there before. Um, you know, we could have a whole nother episode, Howard, talking about um, <clears throat> the foundations of our public education system, its goals, its aims, and the way that it no longer really fits the needs of the child. I'm totally with uh, the kids. I'm with Mandy. I'm with Tasha. It's like it the system isn't working for a lot of kids and it isn't working for a lot of teachers. I don't know that, that any of us in, uh, is interested in dismantling the big system of education because frankly, we still need it. You know, um, there are some questions coming up in your, in your chat about, you know, how much does this cost and who is this good for? Um, those are all things that we really don't know. And it, it in some ways it is, uh, there are many of us working on it in different levels. There are groups of people who are working on making micro schools and pod, pods very affordable for everyone. There are other people who are approaching it um, from a more business oriented aspect. Um, Tasha's right, teachers really do have to unlearn an awful lot in order to have this work. Um, you know, I too am one of those people, I haven't said it, but like I was a, public school teacher in inner city Pittsburgh for over 20 years and became an administrator thinking I was going to help change education and make it more student centered that way, um, only to have my position eliminated. Uh, and then really doing the soul searching to think what could I actually do with all of the skills I have. I went and got a doctorate in instructional technology and got a superintendent's letter thinking I would work on the big systems of education um, from the inside only to find myself outside the system. And I think, um, you know, I like it out here because we do have more freedom and we do have the ability to put whatever is important to us at the middle and most importantly, the kids. It, Leanne, I'm finding sort of two very different ideas here. Uh, one idea is we want to take micro schooling and all of the more progressive ideas and use this moment in time to push that forward. I don't think that's what most people who are thinking about pod schools have on their minds when this begins. I think they're thinking, oh my gosh, the school is going to be closed. What am I doing on Tuesday? And how the heck am I gonna corral somebody to teach or should I do it myself? My sense is that that's the larger movement and that's gonna be the bigger need right now today because the school districts don't seem capable of delivering on what we're paying them to do, to kind of be blunt about it. But Leon, what do you think? I mean, I completely agree that there are these two different things happening right now. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure that, we're, that we pay school districts enough, honestly, to, to you know, safely shelter and educate children during a global pandemic that's not being controlled in this country. So just to put that out there, um, you know, school district budgets have been cut over and over again. And, and I think they're, yeah. So I, I, think, I think there's reasons why, you know, they haven't been able to provide more than they have. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, what I'm hearing, um, you know, Tasha talk about the way she's able to attend to the nine children in her class. I mean, it's, it sounds beautiful. Um, I, I think most teachers probably would love to be able to do that. And most families would probably love to be able to have those experiences for their children. Um, it sounds expensive and I'm not an education policy expert, um, but, um, you know, yeah, I, I mean, certainly it's, it sounds like something that while most teachers and most families and, and, and children and parents would probably love to have something closer to this, um, it, it seems like it would be an uphill battle to actually provide this, um, someone said, you know, for the vast majority of children, we would need a lot more resources and political will to make that happen. Um, and, and, yet, I, and I wonder if it's possible. Yet, and yet we may not have the alternative because if we can't put kids and teachers into schools, we can shut everything down. I, I forget, I think it was Kenya. Uh, they decided to just go, you know what? We're just not gonna do this school year. Um, I don't know that we're gonna be able to get there quickly enough. I think we are doing the school year. We're messing with distance learning but the latest I'm hearing is one in three households have the connectivity that's necessary for fast broadband and all that one in three. Mm -hmm. So add to that the nightmare of trying to make distance learning actually work and to have a second grader sit still long enough to be able to participate in a meaningful way. Nah, I don't think that's, I think it's an interesting idea and an upcoming episode pretty soon we're going to be talking about cyber attacks. So that makes life even more complicated. Uh, so the idea of having a group of people who are local, who trust one another, that they're taking proper care of themselves, because that's a terribly important part of this. Those pieces feel to me like, well, we're in the same apartment building. We tend not to go out very much. And when we do, we go to the same supermarket and the same doctor. There are only six of us. I did some student teaching. How about I start? And suddenly that's become a year of school and the kids are then a little bent out of shape because they're going, you know, this was the best experience I've ever had at school. How do we think about that? Because the, the direction that I'm hearing from all you guys is this is a really good way to learn. And maybe having a lot of people in one school building, although it has its advantages, maybe this is a better way. Anybody want to jump in on that? You know, for that, Howard, I would say that um, from the point of view of, of the families and, and, and folks that we're talking with in our Facebook groups, um, that come, you know, the idea of educational quality, it, it comes up. Um, but honestly, right now, it's, it's in a lot of ways secondary to the question of survival, you know, the what am I going to do on Tuesday question that you mentioned, and, and the fact that 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 parents are desperate and, and have the sense that the cavalry is not coming, you know, the government is not stepping in with the public option um, yet. Um, and, and so it's more of a, how do we make this work? Um, the question of, of um, you know, and, and then from there, you know, that's, that's like the, 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 the basic, how do we survive on the hierarchy of needs? And from there, you know, once people are able to feel like, okay, I think I may be able to um, keep my job and feed my children and keep my children safe, right? Then people are also able to say, okay, well, um, you know, how can we make this more enriching? How, how can we make sure that, that the learning is effective? How can we support, you know, if we're still at a public school, how can we support our school to, to, to better be able to, you know, include all the children in, um, and the learning offerings or, you know, or, or whatnot, or if we're hiring someone, how, how can we make sure that we're hiring someone, um, you know, who's, who's prepared to teach, engage with our children appropriately and teach them and so on. So, so like, you know, once they may have those basic needs met, they, they might begin to think about the pedagogical aspects. Um, that's also, you know, when people are able to, to like breathe and also think about the equity aspects and think about, um, you know, okay, I have a plan for today and tomorrow. I have a hot second. Like, let me also think about um, the community at my public school, the community in my neighborhood, on my block, um, you know, in my in 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 the in the greater city that I live in, and other neighborhoods. Um, you know, what about those kids? How are we going to make sure that those kids don't get left behind? What can I do? 
Um, you know, and, and, and then that's a whole other level of freak out because parents, you know, and families don't want to, and, 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 and the students and children, right? Like nobody wants to see, you know, public school communities get torn apart because some children, um, you know, got support and others didn't this year, right? Um, so like, it, so people are struggling with that, but, but yeah, there, there's no answers yet. Well, we better come up with them soon because the school year is beginning in a minute and a half. Mara? Howard, I was going to say, you know, the, the one piece we've left out of our equation is um, there are a lot of teachers under incredible stress right now. I teach um, some graduate level courses. I know you're, you're teaching as well. And um, teachers are really stressed not knowing what, what realities they're going back to. Many are um, concerned about their own health, concerned about their family's health, um, concerned probably even more so about their ability to actually meet the needs of kids both you know, in these hybrid options that many schools are proposing, um, having to have some kids face to face while there are other children um, at a distance and serving both well. And most of the ones that I'm talking to are saying, you know, I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. And it's something that's keeping them awake at night. So I think, you know, the, the work that Leanne and her group is doing to this, raise this awareness of, yes, you can get your, your families together, and provide safety and security first and foremost for your children so that you can work, so that you can actually maintain some kind of life um, is, is critical. That's the triage piece. And I love the fact that we're like also have this ability together to raise awareness that, you know, it is possible to take those, that triage moment and to say, maybe this was actually better. And we've had these kids here today saying, you know, I really like this. And then to begin to think, do we want to make this a more long lasting model? And that's when we can actually go back to our school districts and advocate and ask. And I saw somebody say, you know, couldn't we be using our school district spaces more like this? Couldn't we be, could we be looking at ways to reassign teachers to work with pods of kids? I mean, I don't know if we can, and I don't know if we financially can, but it seems to be that people are showing with the numbers Leanne's getting in her group, people are raising their hand and saying, I want this for my kids. And the I kids, I think, are saying, I want this as well, because the curriculum isn't exactly, the traditional curriculum is not exactly um, organized to thrill kids every day, right? No. I, mean, I think that would be a fair assumption. So it sounds to me like we need more people doing this, but as we do in households and in small communities, and by that I mean an apartment building and on from there, um, if it's working, what a nightmare for the school district, because suddenly we're going to have a whole lot of parents who are now experienced at doing this at all income levels saying there is a better way. Please stop doing what you've been doing for the last 50 years. So this has the underpinnings of quite a revolutionary idea. Um, I don't know whether we want to go quite that far, but it seems to me that that's what's happening. I don't know whether, you know, it, particularly if we're doing this for a year or longer and students are saying, I learned more in a, I read more books. I did, you know, whatever the metrics are. Um, and Leanne, let me jump back to you because in your real life, before you started doing this, you're a data scientist. Um, how do you measure this? Um, yeah, I wouldn't go so quite so far to call myself a data scientist, but it, but I'm a data worker, let's say. All right. Well, um, you're interested in, in the data side of this. Is that a yeah. fair? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed the question. How do you measure any of this? I, I don't know. I, you know, I... I, I do I, we I, need to measure any of this? Let me ask the question differently. I, you know, my metric for this coming out is, you know, you know, how many people did we have that we were able to care for and keep healthy at the end of this? How many... How many children were able to enjoy their school year, um, have some time, you know, however that is, physical or virtual, with their friends, maintain relationships, feel good about themselves, be, you know, be able to take care of themselves during this time, and, and how many families were, were able to feel that they were able to weather the storm together. I, I'm not sure about, you know, when, when you, you keep mentioning that the school year is starting soon and we have to get our act together. I mean, everyone is scrambling from, you know, um, but in some consensus, the school year is a construct, you know, and, and, and the pandemic has compromised us in so many ways. It's going to compromise the start of the school year for sure. So, so 
I would love for things to be organized by the beginning of the school year, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Um, and I'm not sure if that's where the priority and the most pressing needs really be really are right now. That's fat. Tasha. I want, to speak, I want to speak directly to the expense because I have seen a lot of, um, you know, information out there about how some people are spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars on pandemic pods. We have three micro lab schools here in Cincinnati, and our tuition is a quarter of the cost of most other private schools in this area. And this is true from my experience across the board. Most micro schools are much more affordable than uh, traditional private schools. There are micro Why? schools everywhere. Why? Well, our overhead, our overhead is a lot lower. You know, there aren't layers of administration. We're not in large buildings. Um, the teachers have a lot of autonomy. So I'm guessing, Amy, when you call, when you have a computer problem, you're not call, calling for people from the IT staff to come to your basement. I'm just guessing. Right. No, actually, the kids get to tackle that problem. And if they can't do it, then my husband <laughs> does it. <laughs> Um, Brianne, is that any way to learn? Yeah, the, for Zoom, um, I'm we losing had to help the teachers actually, because most of the students knew more, more, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, more, uh, the kids would use more electronics than the adults. So it was easier, they would ask us, oh, how do you use the whiteboard? Or how do you use, how do you let the other person in? How do you, and we would help them along the way. Though we were not there with them, we could sort of like uh, show them because we would be able to have access to their board and help them. So Emily, what's the purpose of school? to learn as much as you can and to get a college education, if that's the path you're taking, so you can have a good job. That's the purpose of school for me. All right, what do you think the purpose of school is for the majority of people who are your age in the United States? I personally think it's just for us to get into college and get a job. Now, you know that most people your age are not going to graduate college and that most, most of the people, I'm looking at all the faces on the screen, um, most people in any of these generations did not end up graduating college. We have more people in the United States who haven't graduated college than have graduated college. Mm -hmm. So would that change your answer at all? I guess if you aren't planning on graduating car um, college, then just to learn as much as you can and make good relationships with other people and try to figure out what path you're taking and have the teachers and your friends help you with that. Okay, if Carson? Well, I, I agree with Emily. I think school's kind of a way to introduce you to life like at the beginning of a roller coaster, before you start going up, it's kind of that flat stretch where you brace yourself for what's going to happen next. <laughs> there are so many places we can attach that to the coronavirus in the year 2020 that we all want to forget. Um, Amy, when you think about what school is supposed to be, what's your purpose when you begin the day? My purpose when I begin the day is to connect, see, and hear, and listen to every child that is in my care. Um, make sure that they feel valued and seen as a human being, and that they eventually are able to give back to society as adults. Now, you were a traditional school teacher before you started doing this? I was. I taught in the Minneapolis charter school system. Okay. So if I'd asked you the same question when you were doing that, would you have given me the same answer or a different answer? I was a very wide-eyed, naive teacher when I first started, so I would have given you the same answer. But as my years in the system went on, I would have said my purpose is to provide a warm and safe environment and food for these children and so that they have some place to feel loved for eight hours a day. Ah, but who was your boss then? Who's your boss now? Well, I actually had an awesome boss back then, but my boss now is me. So that gives me, you know, 
the autonomy to run my school in the way that's best for the kids that I'm in charge of. So in some ways, because I'm getting to know you a little bit, that fills my heart with cheer. But when I look at those words, if they were written down on a page, it would fill my heart with terror. Oh my gosh, here's this one person who was a teacher and then is, and now she's her own boss. She's making all the decisions. All these kids are going to bend to her will. Um, that's terrifying and delightful. I, I don't know what to make of that. And I don't know how to think about that in terms of the broader, right? So, uh, Tasha, how do you sort this out? I don't think you can standardize microschooling. I don't think that's the goal. Um, this is school beyond standards. I think what we need to do is- That sounds like democracy beyond the people. It sounds like one of those, like, that sounds like an okay idea until the wrong person gets a hold of it. Of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's, that's what our mantra is. Okay. Well, Howard, one of the ways we're, me. I'm sorry. I was going to say one of the ways we're approaching is is uh, uh, Amy and Mandy and I are actually working together to bring school owners together to create the ability to collaborate and cooperate and get the kind of technical assistance that they would have gotten. You know, Amy's role, Mandy's role, Tasha's role is is kind of like being the principal of a one room schoolhouse which by the way, I actually did for a brief stint. And it's, it's, it is tough. So we're, you know, the, the supports that our school districts gave, when you, when you start your own school, you don't have those. Um, so we're working on that. And I think that that helps them to not feel so alone um, and, and not so much like it's the Wild West. I feel like that's, that, I keep coming back to the Wild West and the gold rush. I think that's what's happening with parents feeling like, they um, are not happy with the choices that are being made on behalf of their children and that um, that they have to do something about it. Which at the end of the day, that is the truth. I mean, when you send your child to school, the school acts in loco parentis. And I don't think most parents actually realize that. Um, parents are just taking back their responsibility, which I think is a good thing. If they're trained and capable, yes. If they're aware that that's, that's yes. Yeah. Liam, you walked into something here. Uh, would you have thought about any of this a month ago? Um, a month ago, I mean... Or two months ago. You know, I, I, think, I think a lot of us read those, the same, you know, news stories or, or, you know, a lot of us have known families and friends who were potting up ever since February or March. Um, you know, and, and, and families that, that, you know, for all kinds of different reasons, maybe because the parents had to work outside the home or maybe because the, the specific needs of their children were such that they, you know, really felt that their children could not go without some social time, um, you know, and so families have been getting together throughout the pandemic and forming little bubbles or pods or what have you. Um, I would add too to that, that um, you know, families and communities have been like engaging in like a rich process of community organizing and resource sharing um, in marginalized communities and lo low income communities too throughout this. I think um, they may be less likely to like start a Facebook group and give it a cute name and get covered in, in major national um, you know, media outlets because of it. But, 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 but I think this has been something that, that has been happening throughout the pandemic. Um, but it certainly accelerated a lot, like that roller coaster that Carson was talking about. You know, when when schools started to to say that they were not going to be able to open, um, I think I think most fam you know most families obviously still you know go to go to their public school and are still dependent on and tied to that system. And so, and, and I think are very happily going to go back to schools as soon the very second that their schools are open again. Uh, to be honest, but. Um, but, I agree uh, with you. I actually agree with that, even though I should probably be saying something different. But I think school has served as childcare. What what I hear you saying, Leanne, is that um, the pods are meeting a very specific need of childcare, mm -hmm. and school has served as childcare for a very long time. And when you take that away, I mean, it also serves as food and shelter for too many children, far yeah. too many children in this country. Um, so in, until we can solve all of those problems, I don't know that we can talk about microschooling becoming the norm. Um, so One of the things that we forget is that community is when we all had less money. 
were very reliant upon, in the United States scouting, for example, groups of adults who helped children grow up and taught them an enormous amount about nature and relationships and government and all these different areas. In the United States, we've had a crash and burn with scouting. But in other countries, not so much, but the idea that we as adults have a responsibility to the kids who live nearby, and not only do we watch for them, but we teach them, and we do so in small groups, not a new idea at all. Certainly in, in the New York City I grew up in, it was very common. So we suddenly feel as though we're in this radical place where everything is different. And in many ways, and I think we've all touched on this, it's not that different from what maybe is normal. We've managed to take an education industry and really institutionalize it to the detriment, I think, of, of kids in some ways. And we've managed to take apart the idea of individualization. So let me ask the digital question. If I'm in a pod, but my particular interest in this pod is video games. And I wanna learn math through video games. And I wanna learn social relationships through video games. And I wanna learn everything else through video games. Do I need to be in, do I need to be next door? Do I need to be in your apartment building or is it totally fine for me to be across the country? And if so, could you replicate this idea in a digital way? Carson, what do you think? I mean, maybe there is a certain point where it's nice to actually have I mean, not on a screen, but personally see everyone. I mean, in our school, you see almost all the students in one day and you have a conversation with them. There's a certain thing that the online, when you meet online, that it just doesn't fulfill. Okay, Emily? Um, I feel like when we were using Zoom for the last half of the year, we couldn't really talk. Everybody was talking over each other. So you can learn that way. But I personally prefer being in a classroom because not everybody's talking over everybody and you're not, the teachers aren't confused on using the computer because a lot of these teachers aren't familiar with the technology as we already touched on. And it's just a lot harder, I think, to get your point across on Zoom or any other uh, meeting chat room for me personally. Some people might find it easier, but that's how I personally feel about it. Um, Brienne? I feel the same as Carson and Emily, but also, see, I, I'm friends with younger kids too, and they're not in the classes. So you just get to see your classes, and then sometimes some of the classes are only three people, and you can't really have like a good discussion because if everybody's talking at once, then it just mumbles out the words. And that for me is hard. And then the teachers just get aggravated and it's not <laughs> the best. Not the best. Mandy, what you, what's your latest thinking on this? Um, I prefer the in-person when possible. I just think that the energy is there and the ability to connect on all different levels is there. But I like the use of technology to extend the opportunities for when I have a small group of students and only one is interested in a particular topic, they can connect with people around the world who are interested in that same thing. They can utilize the resources online to learn about something in depth that they just couldn't do in a small group. But you so, want to be the home base. Uh, I think it's good to have a home base. I think I think the the personal community I think is one of the best things that that people are finding from these small micro schools or or that they will enjoy in the pods is just being connected to people who care. Uh, it's 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 really about creating community and, and beyond just the education piece. It's about connecting people in a way that. We haven't been as connected in the past couple decades. It's pretty amazing. It's, I, I mean, I'm certainly having conversations with people who I haven't spoken to in a long time and meeting new people all the time, although I'm resistant to the idea that maybe this is the future because I want to be in person with you guys. The fact is we would not be having this conversation if we weren't in this situation. Leanne, you're, you're seeing that at such an exponential level. Um, 
just this process of change? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've all made compromises and been compromised and had our worlds turns upside down in, in, in these past months. And um, yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen, but I do think that, you know, um, you know, Mandy was talking about liking in person, you know, and technology. And I, I think that's, I think that's what it's going to have to be because, you know, places are different. Local health conditions are changing all the time. The resources of each locality are different of each school and school district are different. Families needs are very, um, you know, some, some, you know, some kids really sort of need that in-person contact more than others. Other families may have medical needs and they may really need to completely isolate for a much longer time than others. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be have to be a case where everything is on the table and, and we and we just try to, you know, get as many solutions that work for as many people as possible out there. Your answer sounds very different from what I hear from school districts. The idea of putting as many options on the table as possible, that sentence has not been said in any of the meetings that I've, that I've attended. Instead, it's how do we replicate the experience of being in a classroom so that it is as normal as possible, including schedules, including bells ringing, including all of the, the trappings of school. And yet, my heart goes to what you're saying. It's time to change. And we have couple of comments here and they've been coming in uh, pretty regularly but um terry where's terry personal opinion after teaching for 20 years the system needs to crumble so a new system can be created so there is definitely that underpinning to this the problem is we have to create it you know it's the jerry garcia thing it's like oh we got chosen to do this um that's not the best tasha what are you thinking how do you put the pieces together of pods and micro schools and change or returning to the old normal? I have some concerns. I mean, I see a lot of people lined up right now who are, I think, hopeful that the system will crumble and they're, they're hoping to extract, extract profit from it. Um, so I think while this is a great idea that we build a new system, like all good ideas, it can go very wrong when you have too many people who are interested in in profit over people. That's how we ended up in this situation to start with. Interesting. Amy? I think that having the most options available for parents is the only way that we're going to figure out what works and what doesn't. And it, there is going to be some time of experimentation and you have to take into account your child and their temperament and their learning style and work with that and Mara, why shouldn't I just go to my school district, go to the, super, the uh, superintendent and say, listen, I just saw this amazing hour with all these really cool people and they have a lot of really good ideas. I need you to watch this. And then we need to organize a community meeting to figure out how to use pods as part of the school system because you guys can't open your buildings and this is an alternative. Is that a reasonable way? I see, before you answer, Carson is shaking his head yes, and I want to hear what you think. Well, yeah, I think it would be a good idea just to see if the public schools would kind of lean towards that, because I know you were saying have them crumble. And that would be an option, but I believe if the public schools themselves would change, it would take a lot less, a lot less time to make that better change into a more pod um, real reality. Well, I, Mara, help. I have this, this habit of following these really articulate kids who say things better than I could. I think he's exactly right. I think people should go talk to their school districts. Um, I happen to be sitting in a school district that uh, Pennsylvania has an awful lot of charter, uh, char charter cyber schools. And I'm sitting in a district that decided not to lose all of the money to the char charter cybers and they created their own cyber program. So kids have the option, they have had for quite some time the option to sign out as cyber students, still have access to um, all of the extracurricular pieces and so on. So, you know, 
some school districts are innovating. There are plenty of good ones out there who have creative ideas, but if yours is one that isn't as creative or doesn't have ideas or is struggling to find ideas, sure, send them, send them our way. We'll be happy to talk about options and uh, Tasha's right, Amy's right, Mandy's right, all the kids are right. We need more options. We are gonna be experimenting for a while and who knows what's gonna happen. But I, what I can tell you is that the kids who are in micro schools by far are happier and that maybe we can take that that lesson from is it Bhutan Howard that had that measures gross domestic happiness, happiness. versus um, gross domestic product? I think we're at this point in time where that's what parents want. They want their kids to be healthy, happy, safe first. And once they have those things in place, then they're interested in you know maybe more innovative education if possible. But um, you know maybe we're going to shift to that kind of thinking as well. I also think about choice a lot. So if there are a whole lot of pods that are available to me, because they're all within walking distance, they could all be in the same building where I live. Um, shouldn't I be able to choose the one I want? Like in school, I have to, I'm assigned to a teacher. I'm assigned to a classroom. Well, it's like cable television. You don't want to watch this. You want to watch that. And if you want to watch Netflix again, instead, that's fine. If you want to watch YouTube, it's fine. Why are we, required to stay in this very rigid way of thinking if there are lots and lots of options, digital pods and analog pods, community pods, whatever we want to call them, wouldn't I want to choose the best thing for me as a student? Leah? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think that the tension here um, that, that I've been seeing is between parent choice or you know family choice and equity because the, the conversation that's been happening in the Bay Area is that um, when families are making ad hoc private solutions and choosing, you know, families with means, families who can, who, you know, who are white collar and can, can work from home, um, families who can afford paid help for their pod um, are, are going to more likely group together, right? Um, because the, not only are those the opportunities and, and is that the level of safety that they want for their family, but, but, but also those are the people that they happen to know, right? And those are the communities that they happen to know, people who are you know, better resourced and well off. Um, so, so the argument against choice is not, it's not because we don't like choice as such, but it's the argument against choice is because, you know, by creating a certain level of standardization, that is how we also include all of the children, right? And make sure that children don't get left out because, you know, they come from a single family home and the other families know that that, that, that parent is not gonna be able to contribute and do as many shifts in the co-op as, as the other families, right? Or because, um, because another child is, um, has, has parents who, you know, who deliver groceries and who are therefore gonna be exposed to the virus. And so other families are, you know, are, are afraid to work with them. You know, it's it's a it's a super impossible situation. We also can't really be forcing families to have their children pod with families that they don't feel comfortable with, right? Like that's also impossible, and that's also problematic. So, um, so I don't know. Just just put out that out there. Like I, I think the question of choice is super fraught and difficult right now. Um, and um, you know, clearly in, in the United States of America, like you know. Family choice is 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 a, is, a, is a value and is sort of enshrined in the way we operate. Um, so so it's with us, but 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 I think it, it carries these 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 difficult implications. The crazy part about this is, if I'm 22 years old, fresh college graduate, and no jobs, I have to be watching this going. Hmm. I wonder if I could organize a pod. I could get. I could work with kids in need. I could serve the community in ways that I haven't been able to. I could build a new path. And by the way, I have six friends who want to do the same thing. And suddenly those people who are delivering groceries, for example, may have an alternative because there's an entrepreneurial kid student. who. So this changes, it, it, it shifts the, the tectonic plates a little bit, or could because this is a very different way of thinking about this, particularly in cities, but I don't think exclusively in cities. I could imagine those kinds of changes happening in, in so many places. So we are running 10 minutes later than we typically do, but this conversation 
is so interesting. Um, and it's so important that we're all at least talking about this, trying to figure out what this is about. So as is our typical habit, we're going to roll the credits and all of you are welcome to hang out because we'll keep the room open for another 15 or 20 minutes and just chat far less formally than we have been. Uh, and thank you all to the many, thanks everybody who's been watching and listening. Uh, we have an enormous number of comments in the chat uh, and many, many very good ideas. And I just want to point out one uh, from Rebecca Muller, um, that there is a vibrant community of micro schools of color. And if you want to learn more about that, the Alliance for Self-Directed Education is one good place to go. So with that, thank you all. I want to keep talking and uh, I'll stay here and I hope some of you will as well. Um, and uh, we will see everybody next week. We're going to start swinging in the next few weeks into the infrastructure that's necessary to keep all of this moving, including Zoom conversations. And not all of that news is as optimistic as you'd like it to be, or I'd like it to be, but it's important that we understand what we're all working with. So with that, thank you all very much for joining and uh, we'll see you on the other side of the credits. demand episodes and more visit our website kids on earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world learning revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning be sure to join us next Thursday for a new episode of reinventing school thanks for watching